the Alaska class, whose designation as a cruiser, or potentially a battle cruiser, has been under debate pretty much from the moment the hull touched the water, which is a debate that we will touch on later, were the last pre-war cruiser design that the US Navy developed. They also represented the third tranche of design types that the US had worked on in the 1930s. The New Orleans and Brooklyn classes had represented treaty cruisers, the Baltimores and Clevelands represented what could be termed the US Navy's first post-treaty cruiser designs, i.e. unconstrained by the collapse of the naval treaties in the mid-1930s, but both of these ships still showed elements of the treaty design period. In both cases, you could make an argument that they're simply treaty cruisers, but on a displacement that actually allowed them to be fully rounded designs in terms of speed, protection and firepower, especially anti-surface and anti-aircraft firepower put together. The Clevelands were still using the 6-inch battery of the Treaty-era light cruiser, and the Baltimores carried exactly the same 8-inch main battery as their predecessors, the several thousand tons of additional displacement largely buying more protection and a heavier anti-aircraft battery, amongst other things. Conversely, the Alaskas, along with the later Des Moines, were effectively unconstrained by treaty limit ideas on anything, which returned them back to the World War I and prior standards of what did a navy want to accomplish, and how much was it willing to pay to do so for a given class of ships. In this case, what the US Navy wanted to do, at least originally, was to address a gap in US capabilities that was starting to worry them. Over the past couple of decades, the US had watched as the Germans had built the Deutschlands, against which the French had built the Dunkirks, and then the Germans had built the Scharnhorsts. The first of these types of ships had large guns and a degree of protection that would make it a very tough proposition for a treaty-era heavy cruiser. The Dunkirks, at least in their original format, were faster, better armoured, and somewhat better protected than their likely opponents, the Deutschlands, and the Scharnhorsts and the Strasbourg were in reality a kind of fast light battleship. One of the aims of the naval treaties was to avoid a repeat of the escalation of the 1900s that had started with the Invincible class Dreadnought Armoured Cruiser, a cruiser that was designed to hunt and kill other cruisers, and ended up creating the entire battle cruiser concept in its various forms. Now, this same thing was happening again, and the US Navy both had a lot of cruisers that would be vulnerable to this kind of cruiser-killing ship, and its primary likely opponent, the Japanese, had both a large cruiser force that the US would really like to have a good way of dealing with, and Japan had gone suspiciously quiet and secretive of late. Well, it didn't take a genius to suspect that perhaps the Imperial Japanese Navy had also been looking at these developments in Europe and decided to embark on its own cruiser hunting cruiser program. A few scattered intelligence reports seemed to confirm this and by the start of the war in Europe, both US and British intelligence agencies were already convinced that Japan was building a 12-inch armed battle cruiser of some description, something that would feature in briefings in late 1941 as a suspected class of ships that had already been completed and was at sea. Ironically, whilst by that point the Japanese did have plans for such a ship, they'd only actually started work on them after work at least initial design work, on what would become the Alaskas had begun, thus creating a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy loop, which had a further twist put on it when, after learning about the Alaskas, the Imperial Japanese Navy did in fact look at revising the design to include 14-inch guns. But all of that was in the future. Beyond hunting enemy cruisers and defending against enemy cruiser hunters in general, it was also felt that such a ship would specifically be a very good carrier escort. It could carry a lot of anti-aircraft guns, its size would make it have a considerable range, its speed would allow it to keep up with the carriers, and its anti-surface firepower would allow it to take out incoming enemy cruisers. In the late 1930s, these were viewed as the main threat to fleet carriers and this would all work regardless of the enemy cruiser's size or armament within reasonable limits. This heavy escort for carriers scratched an itch that had already seen a number of rather odd design specs forwarded as part of the battleship programme, 
including a 30-knot alternative for the North Carolinas, and some early studies of what would eventually become the Iowas that more closely resembled the second coming of the Lexington class of the early 1920s. The latter role, that of carrier escort, greatly appealed to Admiral King, who was of course a carrier enthusiast and would become a champion of the Alaska class during its development. As the 1930s turned into the 1940s, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Bearing in mind that the Iowas had not yet at that point even had their keels laid, and the Japanese Navy's cruiser force was still intact. The loss of HMS Glorious in June 1940 would also seem to still further confirm the US Navy's desire for some kind of fast cruiser hunter. The ship would also allow the more sane US Navy officers to head off some rather questionable ideas that some of their fellows were putting forward, like rearming some of the existing heavy cruisers with twin 10 inch guns in place of their triple 8 inch guns by simply allowing them to point to the bigger and better solution that was in the design process. Winding the clock back a little bit, serious discussion about what would eventually become the Alaska class started in 1938, with the idea for a ship that was armed with three twin 10-inch gun turrets. But this was not well received. The 10-inch gun lay in the awkward middle ground of being just about the smallest calibre for which the rate of fire was more battleship-like than cruiser-like, on account of the weight of the shell and the accompanying charges, but due to being the smallest calibre of this category, it also had the least penetration and killing power. The last time the US Navy had had a 10-inch gun in service, although its shell and its bursting charge weight were about twice as much as the corresponding 8-inch weapon of the time, it had only offered about a 30-40% to 40 better penetration at expected battle ranges of the time, whereas the contemporary 12-inch had offered just over double the penetration of the 8-inch. If one assumed that the same approximate rule of thumb held true compared to a modern 8-inch gun as found on current US heavy cruisers, a 10-inch shell would probably just about be viable at most angles against the better armoured treaty cruisers at the now expected battle ranges, but it might struggle at the upper end of this band against the better protected heavy cruisers. For example, if any of the new Japanese cruisers were protected to anything like the same degree as a Zara class of the Italian Navy, or the USS Wichita, for example. And a 10-inch shell would likely therefore be marginally effective, or perhaps completely ineffective at the same ranges, against an enemy cruiser killer, which would in theory be a little bit better protected. As it turned out, this supposition would actually have been correct against the B-65s, who would have been relatively immune to belt hits from a 10-inch gun at 20,000 yards and upwards, assuming that the general rule of thumb that was being considered held true. Instead, it was felt that the better options were simply to just go with more 8-inch guns using the new super-heavy 8-inch shell, four triple turrets worth of them to be exact, or to escalate directly to a modern 12-inch gun which should have plenty of penetration power and the bonus of an additional range capability, and the shells would of course be more destructive per shot, which was pretty much the same rationale that had led to the development of the Invincibles in the 1900s, a parallel which you might notice a few more times in this account. These two options were then progressed to sketch designs, with four designs resulting from the process. They all shared a number of features, 35 knot top speed, 15,000 nautical mile range at 15 knots, seven twin 5 inch 38 mounts, and in a departure from previous US Navy cruiser designs of the interwar period, a pair of triple torpedo launchers, since these ships were designed for true detached operations. The designs came in pairs, each one representing what the designers thought was an ideal version, the 12-inch option had 8.4 inches of belt armour, which was calculated as giving immunity to 12-inch gunfire in a 6,000-yard band that was centred roughly on 20,000 yards, and the 8-inch option, with a slightly thinner belt, had a 4,000-yard immunity zone centred on at just over 21,000 yards. Then there was the budget offerings, the 12-inch budget offering having slightly less protection than the full-price 8-inch ship, and the budget 8-inch ship having decent protection against 8-inch gunfire, but nothing capable of stopping a 12-inch shell at any range. 
The budget versions save 1,150 tonnes and 1,700 tonnes displacement respectively from a full price standard displacement of 24,900 tonnes for the 12-inch variant and 24,100 tonnes for the 8-inch option. Given the worry that a number of other nations might be building big gun cruiser killers, it was felt that the 12-inch option would be the only viable candidate. And it was also realised that the displacement increase resulting from a shift from three twin to three triple turrets would give a 50% increase in firepower at marginal increase in displacement and cost. And so the next round of quick designs showed a pair of ships with this revised main battery. One of 25,100 tonne standard displacement and another of 26,200 tonne standard displacement. Both of them based on the full price 12 inch variant from the last round of designs, with the displacement difference being that one of them needed 165,000 shaft horsepower to reach 34 knots, whilst the other required 206,000 shaft horsepower to reach 35 knots, well illustrating the absolutely absurd increases in shaft horsepower that you need just for an extra knot of speed at this kind of speed regimen. The faster option was preferred, but the whole program now entered a kind of stasis. It was April 1938, and the focus was switching to battleships and the work that was needed for the upcoming Iowas. The next major mention of the class in any serious context came almost a year and a half later, in November 1939, when the ship, which was now termed CA-2, with CA-1 being the design that would ultimately lead to the Baltimore class, was circulated for opinion on how many of the CA-2 type the fleet should have. As the months went on and discussion circulated, German ships like Graf Spee and Deutschland, later Lutzau, menaced British shipping, and the cruiser hunter looked like a better and better bet. And then someone did the math and realised if they were going to assign a pair of heavy cruisers to escort each aircraft carrier, which was what Doctrine said they should do, then with their current building plans, they would have seven fleet carriers once Hornet was commissioned, which would in turn need 14 heavy cruisers for protection, which would leave them with exactly two heavy cruisers to fulfil all other duties, as Wichita was having issues at the time and wasn't counted as fully commissioned. Early 1940 rolled on, and with authorization for three more carriers, which would be the first three of the Essex class, six more cruisers would be needed. And the debate now circulated as to whether to simply build more of the normal heavy cruisers, a mix of regular and super cruisers, or some regular cruisers and some other type, such as a souped-up Atlanta, nicknamed CLD, or a battle carrier cruiser. Neither of these latter two options won any kind of widespread support. There were two main concerns, however, with CA-2. Firstly, the design was close enough to a capital ship that it might take resources away from the capital ship program, especially in terms of machinery and large gun foundry production time. And secondly, there was a concern that the ship might spark off another Dreadnought-style arms race where the new ship might have an advantage for a year or two, only for someone else to come along with something even bigger to beat it, which of course is exactly what the design actually forced to happen when the Imperial Japanese Navy revised its B-65 program. Although the latter was countered by the argument that anything substantially larger and more heavily armed than the proposed CA-2 would in all reality actually be a small battleship, and thus such efforts would detract from the enemy's ability to reinforce their main battle line, as that kind of ship definitely would be taking resources from capital ship production. And any small, fast capital ship that was produced, if an enemy chose to go down that particular route, would still be very easy prey for the fast battleships that were the Iowas, which were about to be ordered. A confluence of inputs now occurred, however. Intelligence somewhat overestimated Japan's capital ship building program, thinking that they had four ships completed, four on the stocks, and were about to build four more, which resulted in the US Navy's own estimates of what battleships it might be able to spare from its own battle line for detached operations being reduced drastically. 
It was also considered possible that the UK might lose the war to Germany and thus leave the US to deal with the Pacific entirely alone, or, worst case scenario, possibly also having to fight the Germans in the Atlantic as well. And further reports from Japan spoke of a supercruiser program under construction. This had flared up again. It was the same room as we talked about previously, just wearing a slightly different skin. They now specified, however, that these ships were soft, i.e., They were fast, and they were well-armed, but they had sacrificed protection in order to achieve this. A ship like CA-2, it was argued, could defeat such vessels, since it would have some protection against the enemy's guns, but the reverse would not be true. CA-2 could be built in greater numbers than additional Iowas could, and CA-2 types detached from the fleet to pursue enemy raiders, whether they be cruisers or supercruisers, would not manifestly affect the main battle line strength of the US Navy. And thus, in July 1940, Admiral King was able to preside over a meeting which was listed as to determine not whether there should be cruisers with 12-inch guns, but if cruisers with 12-inch guns are to be built, what their characteristics will be. Some arguments continued back and forth, and a few further 8-inch gun concepts were produced as well, mainly for comparison's sake. The Bureau of Ordnance, having already started work on a 12-inch gun, did create something of a binary choice in any case between continuing with existing 8-inch weapons or going with Bjord's new 12-inch, since any other calibre would need to be developed from scratch, and along with the machinery itself, guns were some of the longest lead items for any ship. There was, however, one major change from the original CA-2 sketch. The power plant that would be needed for the ship to achieve 35 knots would fill the hull from port to starboard with nothing but simple hull plating standing between the machinery spaces and a torpedo. The need for at least some form of anti-torpedo defence meant that the ship's top speed would have to drop to around 33 knots. This slightly upsetting news was offset by the news coming out of the Bureau of Ordnance, which for once was actually positive. The stars and the planets had aligned, and the new 12-inch gun was showing some truly remarkable armour penetration characteristics. At medium ranges, it could punch through many existing battleships' protection almost as well, or in some cases just as well, as some of the 14-inch guns equipped on actual US battleships, and thus any supercruiser that was built to truly counter CA-2 would thus need a minimum of modern battleship scale protection, which would make them ruinously expensive, and once again detract from an enemy's capital ship building program. The only cloud to this extensive silver lining was that any real idea of armouring CA-2 against her own guns across a wide margin of range would have to be abandoned in favour of extensive protection against 8-inch gunfire, unless either the existing proposed belt thickness was massively upgraded, or some clever trick could be found to improve the belt's performance. Or maybe both. Four designs were made to look at the issue, CA-2A through CA-2D starting with only protection against 8-inch fire, and gradually stepping up the immune zone to 12-inch gunfire, eventually ending up with a ship, CA-2D, which had an inch more armour than an Iowa-class battleship, displaced 38,700 tonnes, i.e. more than an actual Treaty-era battleship, and was armed with 12 guns in four triple turrets, largely because the hull had grown to a size where, well, why not stick in a fourth turret? Slightly alarmed by this, another proposal looked at what was basically a Baltimore with twin 12-inch swapped in to replace the triple 8-inch, and another concept looked at a 12-gun 8-inch armed concept, as well as some designs that were, in theory, able to swap between triple 8-inch and twin 12-inch at will. Like something akin to an overgrown version of what the Japanese had done with the Megamis. And there were some other variants that looked at reducing the main battery to seven or eight guns to try and save a bit of weight. The summer of 1940 would now see a long string of design options, which have rightly been described as tortuous. It started with Admiral King issuing a general design specification for a 20 to 24,000 ton ship with eight guns, now protected against 11-inch gunfire. 
i.e. what German commerce raiders were carrying. This would then be changed to have protection against the ship's own 12-inch guns, but the protection scheme would now be based on cruiser rather than battleship spec as it had been before. For US battleships, the immune zone against incoming fire was calculated assuming that the armour would meet the incoming shell at 90 degrees, the least favourable angle for the armour and the best favourable angle for the shell. But for cruisers, it was assumed that the shell would be incoming at 60 degrees. This meant that less armour was needed to meet the requirement because the armour would be artificially sloped by the ship's angle and thus increase its apparent thickness, the logic being that a cruiser would be aiming to approach or disengage at some kind of angle, or just manoeuvring generally, rather than simply sailing broadside to broadside and slugging it out with an opponent. But trying to balance this effort at surface gunfire protection and reasonable underwater protection requirements first saw the number of guns dropped down to seven, and then down to six, all in an effort to save weight, and then when it was clear that this was far too little firepower, especially aft, where only two guns could be brought to bear, the displacement started going up. Then machinery space armour was reduced so that only the 12-inch magazines met the protection standard even in its revised format, but this then needed an internal bulkhead added to stop angled fire coming in via the machinery spaces punching into the magazines anyway, and so most of that weight saving was negated. Underwater protection, which had originally been designed to battleship spec with numerous liquid and void spaces, even if the total resistance wasn't quite as good as a full-scale battleship's, was completely eliminated to save weight. And then brought back again in a reduced form more akin to cruiser spec, i.e. multiple layers of hull plating, as no anti-torpedo protection at all was understandably seen as a little bit unwise. All of these changes dropped the speed down to 30 knots, and so firepower, which had been increased again briefly after the drop down to 6 guns, fell back now to 7 guns to try and claw back a little bit of extra space for a bit of additional machinery. Eventually, another meeting was held, and whilst many involved ended up voting for CA-2B, a 32,500 tonne ship with 9 guns and heavy armour, the final decision was made to continue with the development of CA-2G, a 27,500 tonne version with slightly less armour and one less gun, specifically the super firing turret forward was a twin instead of a triple. Most of the fittings would be cruiser-like, and a profile would show a very strong resemblance to existing US cruisers. This included having the aircraft hangar amidships, as was standard for US cruisers at the time, as opposed to mounting the aircraft on the fantail, as was done with US battleships of the period, the amidships mounting was thought to improve the aircraft's operational capabilities, as it could be launched in rougher seas, and in theory would make the aircraft somewhat more durable and survivable in most combat circumstances, since the hangar could be blast-proofed and the aircraft could be stored in them. The wartime lessons of Guadalcanal, which showed that this was generally speaking a bad idea, at least the way that it was laid out on things like the New Orleans class cruisers, were at this point still some years in the future. The exception to this cruiser-like, except scaled up, nature was the primary fire control, which was raised to enable the greater range of the 12-inch guns to be taken advantage of, something that had been missed in most of the previous design versions. The original armour scheme was supposed to be at 10.1 inches of vertical belt armour over the magazines and 7.7 .7 inches over the machinery. But someone cleverly suggested that if one inclined the belt by 10 degrees, this would allow for a uniform 9.5 inch thick belt, which would increase the machinery protection as well as the protection for the 5 inch magazines, without compromising overall magazine safety, as the resistance of the angled 9.5 inch belt would be as good or slightly better, depending on the range and angle, as a 10.1 inch vertical belt. However, torpedo protection at this point consisted only of several layers of plating and an awful lot of subdivision. 
which was still further increased as the designers began to get increasingly nervous about the potential of torpedo and mine impacts. The full-scale protection as found in battleships having been abandoned, as mentioned earlier, because it simply took up too much space and weight. Turret armour was also varied. The turret faces would still be the thickest part, but the sides, roof and back would now be almost uniform instead of the thinnest armour being at the back of the turret. It was felt that the Battle of the River Plate had showed that a supercruiser might have to fight multiple enemies from many angles at once, and so the back of the turret would need to be thicker than normal. And it was felt that there was precious little point in making the turret roof thick enough for extreme range engagements, when the deck armour wasn't going to be thick enough for those engagements. And so the roof armour could be thinned down to give the same kind of immune zone as the deck armour did. The number of 5-inch guns had been reduced to 6 twin mountings, but by superfiring a mounting each over the fore and aft main battery guns, with 2 remaining mounts per side, this meant that the overall heavy anti-aircraft broadside that had been planned, 8 guns, would be maintained. At this point, a check revealed that the ship was now actually a fraction under its target weight, and so the ninth gun was restored, with the superfying forward turret going back up from a twin to a triple. For the most part, the ship now pretty much resembled an upscaled cruiser in the layout, if not the thickness of the protection, and the degree of underwater protective features, albeit with a few battleship influence style changes shown by the more extensive coverage of the belt, duplicated fire control system functions, and other things like the elevated fire control position mentioned earlier. The ships would also have a cruiser-style single rudder, which would turn out to be a small mistake, but not something that was readily apparent at the time. CA-2 was now redesignated CB, officially the new marker for a large cruiser, whatever that meant, with six ships ordered, Alaska, Guam, Hawaii, Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Samoa. The use of what at the time were American territories reflected their intermediate condition. They were larger than the city names used for heavy cruisers, but considered slightly lesser than the state names used for battleships. Detailed design was rapidly completed and the keel of USS Alaska was laid down at the end of 1941, ten days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Guam followed at the start of February 1942, but in April of the same year, steel began to run short, and so the last four ships were suspended in favour of diverting resources to the Essex-class programme. Admiral King stepped in the next year to restart work on Hawaii, which would be eventually laid down at the end of 1943, but the other three ships would also be cancelled that summer in favour of other work. Minor changes followed as the ships were built, the replacement of the originally planned 1.1-inch mounts with 40mm Bofors being an obvious example, and then of course the installation of still more 40mm Bofors and of course 20mm Orlikans, which would replace the 50 cal mounts and then start to multiply. The ships were also briefly considered for a carrier conversion, although that turned out to be a very short-lived consideration. The electronic suite was also constantly updated as newer and better radar systems were developed. All of these minor additions gradually pushed up the ship's weight, and the first two ships entered the water in 1943, and their trials in 1944 showed that speed had unsurprisingly dropped a little bit, with Alaska making 32.7 knots at initial trial displacement, dropping another knot when she was fully loaded. Operational range had also dropped slightly, although quite happily turning radius was a little bit tighter than anticipated, although still not brilliant. Their arrival in service in 1944 prompted a series of massive arguments between different departments and the officers that were being asked to lead the ships, some of whom hated the ships, others defended them, some out of genuine affection, and some others simply because, well, they'd spent years and years developing them, so they must be right. Some issues, especially the extensive aircraft facilities and midships, were now seen as less useful with the advent of radar, and possibly even dangerous in light of the aforementioned wartime experience. And these were picked up on more than some of the other potential issues. Eventually, 
it was proposed that these aircraft facilities would be removed and there would be a simpler aft-mounted solution as found in battleships, which, along with replacing the heavy conning tower with a lighter splinter-proof only option, would allow all the remaining 40mm guns, as some would have been lost putting the aircraft catapults aft, along with 22 automatic 3-inch guns in twin mountings and a plethora of directors and radars, all to be installed. But by then the war was over. As you might guess, the Alaska and Guam, only coming to service in 1944, had short wartime careers, both serving primarily as anti-aircraft escort ships with a bit of shore bombardment thrown in for good measure, their main accomplishment of note being escorting the damaged USS Franklin home after she was crippled by Japanese attack. With the crews suffering no fatal casualties during the war as a result of enemy action, indeed the only battle casualties of any note appear to have been when a few of the crew were a little too close to a 5-inch gun that was firing to defend the Franklin, and as a result they got slightly burned by the muzzle blast when it fired. After Operation Magic Carpet returning US troops back to the continental United States and the subsequent reduction of the US Navy in size, the ships were seen as too expensive to run as cruisers when so many fresh out of the production yard Baltimores were available, and they weren't strong enough to keep around for battle line uses when the Iowas were around. And so they were sent into reserve in 1946, shortly joined by the Hawaii, which had been launched in 1945 and had slowly been fitting out until early 1947 when this work was stopped, with the main battery having been installed, but none of the lesser guns having been placed. Whilst the first two ships were then kept in reserve in case they were needed, the partially finished Hawaii was subject to a wide range of possible ideas for conversion. This included a bizarre hybrid which installed a short flight deck with catapults forward for questionably uncertain use, but possibly to launch Loon missiles, which was an American derivation of the German V-1, amongst other things. XPM SAMs were to be installed on the wing 5-inch mounting pits, and new larger pits would be sunk aft for a number of modified V-2 short-range ballistic missiles, along with various new guidance radars to point all these new weapons in their various appropriate directions. Other missile systems were also proposed in order to turn the vessel into a test ship, and then it was also proposed to fit multiple 3-inch automatic gun mountings, which would make it into something of a hybrid test missile vessel, but also a front-line warship. But the XPM missile launcher had a rate of fire that would have made even an 1880s ironclad laugh. A maximum of one round every 10 minutes. And that was on a good day. Initial tests had one round every half hour. And the modified V2s would require vast amounts of liquid rocket fuel to be stored aboard. Which no sane US Navy officer was in any way, shape or form happy about. As a result, the only thing that the program actually resulted in was the removal of the 12-inch turrets from the Hawaii. In the early 1950s, another role was thought to be possible. A command cruiser festooned with radar and communications equipment to assist the carrier groups. This version, at first called for the originally planned anti-aircraft suite to be fitted, i.e. 40mm guns and 5-inch 38s, but with the main turrets left off to save weight for the electronics. The, this evolved somewhat, the, eventually calling for every gun mount on the ship whether that be the main barbette or one of the 5-inch 38 barbettes, to instead carry a single 5-inch 54 gun, plus a few more scattered around where space allowed, plus a hangar aft, and a landing pad for helicopters. This was then changed further to 8 twin 5-inch 54 gun mounts and 10 twin 3-inch automatic gun mounts, and no hangar. But whilst waiting for results on an experimental radar that was also to be fitted and had initially been fitted to the USS Northampton, the budget for the conversion of Hawaii was diverted to other things. And then finally, in later 1956, a proposal was made to turn the ship into a pure surface-to-air missile vessel, with Talos launchers fore and aft, plus the ASROC ASW weapon and four shorter-range Tartar missile launchers. <laughs> 
alternatives to this were proposed, which included either four Regulus nuclear cruise missile launchers or 20 Polaris intercontinental ballistic missiles in a silo farm installed where the aft turret and barbette originally had been installed. And, well, these were proposed with a varying number of Talos and Terrier missiles for the ship's defence. In theory, she would be the lead ship for such conversion, whichever option was selected, and the Alaska and Guam would then follow with similar conversions, which would be based on any lessons learned from the first one. However, these also came to nothing, largely on clock cost grounds, as the slim cruiser-like hull form didn't afford all that much more volume compared to converting the slightly smaller and much cheaper regular heavy cruisers that were still around. And so, at the end of the 1950s, the three ships were listed for disposal and sold for scrap over the next couple of years, with Guam being the last to reach the breaker's yard in 1961. Well, now you've heard the history, what about the controversy? Are they really large cruisers, super cruisers, whatever you want to call them? Or are they battle cruisers? This is an argument that's raged pretty much since the ships were launched. In fact, even before the ships were launched, there were newspaper articles in the United States saying that they were battle cruisers. And then, of course, there's the US Navy's own official designation, which says that they are large cruisers. And so let's have a look at the various potential solutions to this argument. Now, first of all, yes, I know some people are going to say, well, the US Navy calls them cruisers, and therefore they're cruisers. Uh, to which I would say, whilst in general it's a good idea to follow what a navy says it has, on the other hand, especially when it comes to battle cruisers in particular, navies can be very twitchy about it. The US Navy, for example, designed a number of battle cruisers before starting to build the Lexingtons, but then when the Lexingtons were actually being built, they were labelled CC, not BC. Um, and the, there's this ongoing thing protesting that the Lexingtons were in fact massive scout cruisers, when pretty much everybody agrees they are actually battle cruisers. And over the other side of the pond, you have the King George V being called battle cruisers, despite the fact they are clearly fast battleships. And Vanguard was called a fully armored battle cruiser. Both of these purely on the basis that they were faster than twenty five knots, which was a British arbitrary distinction of what made a battleship or a battle cruiser. So, yes, whilst navies do have a fair degree of authority over what they call their ships, whether or not what they call their ships reflects reality is not necessarily always a hundred percent correlation. Nevertheless, let's look at some of the arguments surrounding it, as mentioned, and see what we can come up with. Some of this will also apply in a future video when I talk about Hood and Iowa, but that's for another time. Let's look at the purpose of the ships. Are, is their purpose that of a heavy cruiser, a large cruiser, super cruiser, or a battle cruiser? Well, as mentioned, as well as the carrier escort role, the other purpose, and indeed the main initial design purpose of the Alaskas, as well as a good chunk of their purpose when even they're doing the carrier escort mission, was to hunt and kill enemy cruisers that were lesser than it. This is exactly the same purpose as the Invincible class were designed for, as Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers. So you could make an argument that they are battle cruisers because they share the same design purpose as the original battle cruisers, or then you get into the whole argument of the fact that as mentioned, the Invincibles weren't called battle cruisers at first, they were called dreadnought armed cruisers, and the term battle cruiser was retroactively applied to them. However, the other World War I battle cruiser types, pretty much the entirety of German production and British production from the Lions onwards, were also designed not just to kill enemy cruisers, but to engage with, or at least have the capability to engage with, others of their type and in the German case, to supplement the battle line. The Alaskas were not specifically designed to be able to supplement the US battle line, but they were, at least in theory, designed to be able to fight enemy supercruisers, battle cruisers, whatever you want to call them. So the Alaskas are in a slightly odd spot of sharing both a primary design purpose, which is in common with the original battle cruiser, 
but also have an additional expanded design role, not including the carrier escort, which wasn't part of World War One for obvious reasons, that is shared by all later battle cruisers up to the ones that were built in wartime, like Hood. So that would seem to indicate perhaps they are battle cruisers. Okay, well, let's look at the method of build. They are, as discussed, largely taken from cruiser design principles and scaled up, with the exception of their armament. This is, again, very similar to the Invincibles, which, when you look at the hull form, are very similar to the Minotaur-class armoured cruisers, just with bigger guns and scaled up slightly. So, in terms of, is a battle cruiser a scaled up cruiser with some heavier guns? Well, that would fit the early battle cruisers, and it would also fit the Alaska class. But we do have a slight departure here, because the later battle cruisers, Lion, Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Tiger, and the German production line in general, starting from von der Tann, tended to take more influence from the battleships and slightly play around with the figures in terms of protection versus firepower versus speed more so than they evolved from the old armored cruisers and indeed the first generations of battle cruiser which i suppose technically you could count blucher in if you really stretch it a little bit so there is some difference showing up there then you get on to the larger differences. Now, admittedly, some of this is a little bit arbitrary because you can come up with numerous definitions of battle cruiser. You can come up with a definition of battle cruiser by role, which is what we discussed earlier with the Invincibles. You can come up with the definition of battle cruiser by build type, which we just discussed as well. You can come up with a definition of battle cruiser by speed, which is what the British did for a while. You can come up with a definition of battle cruiser that's based on its protection and firepower relative to contemporary battleships and all sorts of other things. But let's look at the Alaskas in particular and how that relates to various colloquial definitions of battle cruiser. Well, the size of its guns. Now, one of the things that is near enough uniformly true across all battle cruiser types, at least those that were built and most of those that were designed with the uh, notable exception of the G3s, is that their guns are of the same caliber as contemporary battleships. They might carry fewer of them, potentially, not necessarily true in the case of the Amagis, but they are usually the same. So the Invincibles and the Indefatigables are built with 12-inch guns at a time when the British battleships have 12-inch guns, and when the British move up to the Orion-class Super Dreadnoughts with 13.5-inch guns, the Lion-class move up to 13.5-inch guns as well. Tiger rounds that off, and then the British move on in battleship terms to Queen Elizabeth's own Revenges with 15-inch guns, and subsequent British battle cruisers, renowned Repulse and Hood, all have 15-inch guns. The Germans similarly. Von der Tann is built when the Nassau's are around, 11-inch armed. There's a little bit of lag with the Germans with the Moltke class and Seydlitz still having 11-inch guns, and then only moving up to 12-inch guns with the Der Flingers, when, from the Helgelands onwards, the German battleships had 12-inch guns, but, you know, the Nassau's were just entering service, so near enough as makes no difference. And when the Americans were contemplating battle cruisers, when they looked at a version of the Wyoming class, it was armed with 12-inch guns, same as the Wyoming's, and when they were designing the Lexington class, it was armed with 16-inch guns, the same as the South Dakota 1920 types, the Japanese... The Amagis and the Tosas both had 16-inch guns, and as we mentioned earlier, the only exception to this rule was the G3s, really, which were built with 16-inch guns, or were to be built with 16-inch guns, when the N3s had 18-inch. Now you look at the Alaskas, well, what is the current gun size of US battleships in the late 1930s and early 1940s? It's the 16-inch, whether it's the 16-inch 45 on the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas, or the 16-inch 50 on the Iowas. There's also obviously the 14-inch guns on the standard types, but the Alaskas have 12-inch guns, which are a considerable step down. Now, as we mentioned, they're very good 12-inch guns, but they aren't 14- or 16-inch weapons. 
and they you know as much as they might be competitive with the US standards 14 inch guns I doubt they would be competitive with a 14 inch gun designed by the same gun companies in the late 1930s so the Alaskas do have a major departure here from regular battle cruiser design in that whilst they have heavier guns than contemporary cruisers they do not have the same kind of weaponry as contemporary battleships now we can look at the size and displacement of a battle cruiser relative to a battleship this starts off obviously with invincible and dreadnought where their displacement is not that far apart and as things go on the battle cruiser generally tends to get larger and larger so battle cruisers tend certainly by world war one to have more displacement than the contemporary battleship now with the alaskas this is obviously not the case the alaskas despite one or two designs that would have actually pushed them above the north carolinas and south dakotas in displacement as built were many thousands of tons lighter than the north carolinas and south dakotas and of course they were built at a time when the iowas were the latest and greatest u.s battleships and they came into service at a time when the montanas might if the build process had continued to have just about been launching and the Alaskas are much, 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 much lighter ships than either the Iowas or the Montanas. So they break with the old battle cruiser tradition in this way as well. They're much smaller vessels. Speed relative to battleships. Now, battle cruisers have in the past always been faster than battleships that is pretty much an unbroken rule the invincibles and indefatigables are faster than the dreadnought the lions are faster than the orions and hood renown and repulse are faster than the qe's and repulse the same applies for the germans the same applies for the american designs that weren't completed especially the lexingtons and the same also applies for the japanese with the congos and obviously the amagis when they were planned as battle cruisers Alaska, however, whilst faster than North Carolina and South Dakota, and obviously also faster than the Montanas, is not faster than the Iowas. In fact, actually, thanks to the increasing weight during her construction, she's actually a little bit slower than the Iowas. Now, granted, the Iowas are a little bit of an out-of-context problem when it comes to discussing battleships, but nevertheless, they are the contemporary battleships at least for the purposes of this discussion, of the US Navy. And the Alaskas are not faster than them. So another break with the tradition of the battle cruiser having a significant speed advantage over the battleship. So it would seem that there are actually quite a substantial number of differences between the battle cruiser design paradigm as established in the 1900s and 1910s and early 1920s for that matter and the Alaskas, which would tend towards them being viewed as, more accurately, yes, large cruiser, super cruiser, cruiser killer, whatever it is you want to call it, but not battle cruiser. Then the argument becomes, well, what would a period battle cruiser look like? What would the Alaskas have to have if they were going to be contemporary battle cruisers? Well, there's two approximate ways of looking at it, again, based off of the World War I design runs. You can either look at it very crudely in terms of it needs to be faster than a contemporary battleship, but would have similar caliber weaponry, but less of it, and obviously would also have less protection. So that's, that's an easy rule of thumb which you can use to describe most battle cruisers of the 1900s and 1910s era so what would we look at would we look at the iowas well they're being built contemporary-ish with the iowas but as we said their initial design studies go back to 1938 when the south dakotas would have been the contemporary design so if they hadn't had that year and a half pause they would have been probably designed against the south dakotas so if we take a South Dakota class, 28 knots, 9 16 inch guns, 12 inches of angled armor, we'd probably come up with a ship with approximately Iowa-like speed, 33 knots, 
probably six guns. Reduce all the gun turrets down by one to make them twins. So six 16 inch guns in three twin turrets and less armor. So probably actually the 9.5 inch inclined belt that they had historically, maybe just a fraction thicker. But that's roughly what a period battle cruiser based on the South Dakotas would look like if you followed the majority of World War I rule of thumb battle cruiser design principles. And the Alaskas very blatantly are not that. The other thing you could do is look at the last battle cruisers to be built, or well, last battle cruiser specifically, Hood. Unless you start to get into arguments about the Dunkirks and so forth, but we'll leave that aside for the minute. And again, assuming that Hood is a battle cruiser, which is another uh, argument, as mentioned, we'll be covering in another video in the future. Well, what was Hood's design spec? Hood's design spec was same armor protection as the contemporary battleship class, the Queen Elizabeth's, same firepower, eight 15 inch guns, just much faster. And so you ended up with Hood. The armor being 12 inches of angled armor instead of 13 and a bit inches of vertical armor, but you know, protection spec is pretty much the same. So if we compare that with the South Dakota and go, okay, well, we want the same armament, we want the same protection, but we want things to be just faster. <laughs> well, ironically enough, that's how you end up with USS Iowa. Because <laughs> that's pretty much what she was until someone went, mm, I'm not sure we want to spend 10,000 tons just for a bit of extra speed. And they slapped 16, point, 16 inch 50 caliber guns on her. So is Alaska, Iowa? Well, no, definitely not. So it would appear by all means that a contemporary battle cruiser, whatever rule of thumb design argument you want to make for the late thirties and early forties does not resemble Alaska at all. It resembles either a diminutive Iowa or Iowa herself. So with that, um, although my original thoughts back when I first started looking at naval history were that the Alaskas pretty much were battle cruisers based largely on the fact they shared a design mission goal with the Invincibles. Nowadays I, as mentioned, do tend to believe that they are in fact just large cruisers in keeping with the US Navy designations. Now, as mentioned in this little discussion segment, whether or not Iowa or Hood are fast battleships or battle cruisers, well, that's another bone of contention, so look out for that in the future. A little spoiler alert there. But other than that, thanks for listening, and see you another time. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.